feel like I should move my hair. <laughs> Good evening. This is a meeting of the Scarborough Board of Education. It's December 17th, and this is a workshop evening. May I have the attendance, please? Mrs. Bealy? Here. Mrs. Lyford? Here. Mrs. Massengill? Here. Dr. Miles? Here. Mrs. Murphy? Here. Mrs. Perry? Here. Mrs. Shea? Here. Ms. Hobbs? Ms. Fardell? Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Any adjustments to the agenda? No. 5.0, do I have a motion to go into executive session pursuant to MRSA subsection 4056A for the purpose of hearing from the superintendent Charges against an employee and for setting a hearing date with the board for that employee to return to public session following that executive session. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Seven. Very good. Thank you.
We are now returning from executive session. We are now back in the public session of our school board meeting. And I would need a motion to conduct a hearing to consider a personnel matter on January 27, 2016. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Very good. All in favor? Seven. Thank you. Now we're moving on to uh, new business. 6.1. Uh, is there a motion regarding the minutes of December 3rd? Move approval is printed. Second. Very good. Any corrections? All in favor? Seven. Thank you. 6.2. The second reading of policy GCBC, the employment of coaches and advisors. You may recall we had first reading two weeks ago. Is there a motion? Move approval as presented. Second. Very good. Any discussion? I will say that, that we have not made any changes to it since last No time. additional changes. I believe that right. typo has There's been typo, corrected. Right. Okay. I'm double checking that that's what you have in front of you. Yep. I think it's corrected. Yeah. Yes. No further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Seven. Thank you. 6.3. Do I have a motion to enter into a contractual agreement with the New England School Development Council, known as NESDEC, for the purpose of assisting with board, the board with a superintendent search? Move approval. Second. Any discussion? I just have one question. Did anybody ever reach out to them then? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Go on, one of the Yep. Very good. Anything else? All in favor? Seven plus one. Thank you. And 7.0. We'll now enter the workshop, 7.1. <laughs> the work of NIAS giving us an update will be Mr. Creech this evening or Dr. That's true. It's, um, we have both um, uh, Monique Culberson and David Creech, uh, uh, and we have on deck NIASC and also a curriculum update. Are we starting with NIASC? I see it up there. So um, David with his fancy transitions and but yet plain PowerPoint slides. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and forward. Uh, I don't like to show on. No. <laughs> <laughs> we'll Monique. Good evening. I beg your pardon, sorry about that. They are, and I've assumed that everybody has one. If not, I'll take a moment for... With PowerPoint presentations, you're able to print those out so there can be notes taken on the side of the slides. I'm not sure if that's a function of a Prezi, but... So again, I wanted to thank you um, for giving me the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Um, we are... Tonight's presentation is regarding the NIAS accreditation process, and it's a process that um, we have gone through 13 years ago as a school. Uh, the decennial process for us was three years ago, uh, but that had been backed up for two, two years, um, and we are going to be starting our process that I'm going to be explaining to you uh, next year. So. To begin with, an overview of what we're going to discuss tonight. I'm just going to briefly share with you a little bit about uh, the New England Association of Schools and Colleges, talk to you a little bit about one of the four committees that we deal with, specifically the Committee on Public Secondary Schools, and really what is the meaning and the value of this accreditation process. And then we'll talk to you, I'll share with you what the process is going to look like for Scarborough High School and the resources we're going to need to support that process. start out. That's for uh, Dr. Entwistle who likes bees, so I started with a honeycomb. So the New England uh, Association of, Co of Schools and Colleges, NEASC, so it's the oldest, nation's oldest regional accrediting association. Over 2,000 public and independent schools, colleges, universities. The six states listed there plus international schools. This association is comprised of four commissions which are listed there for you. The Commission on Public Schools will be the commission that we deal with directly. 
This association's pur purpose is exclusively educational. The public and educational community are served in two parts. One, there's an establishment and maintaining of high standards of ec educational excellence. And two, they're utilizing an evaluation process that focuses on self-improvement through effective peer review. I'm going to explain to you a little more detail to that in a moment. Um, all the member schools and colleges undertake this reflective self-study that we're going to speak to in a minute. That consists of faculty, administration, staff, students, community members, and board members as being a part of this process. Then a committee of peers, traditionally professional educators from other schools, will serve on a visiting committee that will visit us to evaluate whether our alignment to the standards are in place. The committee then follows the process that includes reviewing all the findings of the self-study, which we will conduct next year, which we will identify areas of strength at Scarborough High School, and there will be recommendations made by this committee that will lead to school improvement. Here's a little bit about a little bit on the Committee of, uh, on Public Secondary Schools. They have over 630 K-12 middle high and high schools in New England that this particular committee serves. Its mission statement is listed there for you. It's similar to what we discussed earlier for NEASC. Uh, they're a partnership with member schools. It ensures that this accreditation process is ongoing and really it's set up to benefit our students. Very similar to what we have in place at the core of what we do with our student-centered learning here at Scarborough. Here are their core values. Their mission speaks specifically as to what they're committed to. These standards of accreditation, by the way, are developed by and reviewed and modified by the member schools. There's a committee of about 26 members that are comprised of schools in the six states. The mission is where the, the member schools basically agree to participate in this accreditation process and then we demonstrate adherence to those standards of accreditation through our academic, social, and civic growth for our students, for our professional staff and our faculty, and then that continuous improvement of our schools. That has to be something that's just not done when we have our self-study and a site visit. It has to be a part of our culture, not only at the school, but at the district level. And here's the meaning and value of this accreditation. Once this accreditation process is completed, NEAS will basically be assuring that this educational institution has conducted the self-evaluation of all of our programs, that we have hosted a visiting committee that's assessed whether our institution in terms of the standards that we have and our educational goals have been met or if there are goals that we have to establish based on recommendations from that, that committee or from our self-study, we might have recommendations internally that we make. And all of those are aligned to standards that I'm going to share with you in a moment. These standards of accreditation that I researched, that I re referred to earlier, are research based. They're a set of practices that are best practices. Uh, these concepts provide guidance for the schools in all aspects of our educational process the academic, civic, and social for all of our students. And so these are living documents. And just like the work we're already undergoing here at the district, uh, we review and reflect and modify as needed when we move forward, just as the NEASC process asks us to do. I hope I'm not boring you so far with the transitions, but I think it's better to build. <laughs> so the Committee on Public Secondary School Standards for Accreditation serve as the foundation for this process. So NEASC uh, is in charge. However, we have the four committees and this one committee that we're dealing with that I mentioned earlier that has over 630 schools associated with this. There are seven standards that we are going to be evaluated on and these are qualitative, challenging, and they reflect, like we mentioned before, current research and best practice and that is huge. These standards are updated on a regular basis. I will tell you that we're coming in at I, what I would consider an ideal time with the NEASC accreditation process. In the past, some schools have found it a challenge to manage this process. Um, boxes and boxes and boxes of information collected and processed for each standard. They have taken feedback from member schools and they have changed this process. It's more digital. It's aligned to allowing us to not only look at all the standards but streamline that and focus on the standards that we really believe as a school we need to improve in and uh, the process has become, according to the schools that are undergoing the pilot right now, something that staff don't um, 
fear or perceive as being overwhelming and too much. So they've listened to member schools and they've adjusted their practices. There's a three-phase accreditation process. The first piece is a reflective 12 to 18 month self-study and that self-study is based on when our site visit occurs. So our self-study, since our site visit is in the fall of 2017, will occur basically the next school year. So the fall of 2017, is specifically November 5th through the 8th, is when we'll have a site committee visit us. That means, excuse me, that next year is when the self-study itself will be conducted. We are already doing um, a large amount of planning and preparation this year by putting the leadership and the resources in place so that when we start the self-study next year, we start the ground running when we start the school year. Everything is in place that we need to do, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. There's a four-day on-site evaluation visit. It typically starts on Sunday and ends on a Wednesday, and that's the site committee that we referenced earlier. Those are made up of professionals from other schools. As a member of school, it's a responsibility of ours to send some of our teachers uh, administrators and others to serve on these site committees. So not only is it um, a benefit for us to be a part of this process, but we get to go out and help other schools. And what we're going to be in the process of doing this spring is sending key leaders for our process out to schools as a part of these site committees so they can gain a better understanding of the new updated version of this process. And then following that site visit in November of 2017 will be a multi-year follow-up process. So from this information that we've gathered through the self-study and the site visits, we're going to end up coming up with a two-year and a five-year plan. And we will put that plan in place in the school year 2017-18. So there is a follow-up process to this, and that's why this is ongoing reflection and improvement. So we'll just briefly, I'll touch upon the self-study process. During the 12 to 18-month self-study, it's our school's responsibility to assess the degree to which our educational programs, our services, and all the processes we have in place meet these standards. So uh, myself, two of the assistant principals, uh, Sue Ketch and uh, Greg Appelstein, and our two standards co-chairs, David O'Connor um, and Laura Fine, we went to a seminar to learn a little bit about the new self-study. Um, and it really, it was made very clear to us two things that rang true during that seminar. One was the self-study itself should not replace existing professional development. Schools, whatever professional development that are in place right now that we have either at the district level or the school level has to remain intact. The time that's being spent on that must continue. That's what we've seen internally as those things that we need to focus on as a school or as a district. NEASC says do not have the self-study replace this or set it aside temporarily. Continue that professional development. Secondly, once you see some of the specifics of the self-study, this truly is a form of professional development. It's a very comprehensive look at how our school does business. What are the programs and services we have in place? The facilities, the leadership, it's very comprehensive. It's a form of professional development and it should be treated as such. And by that, we have decided that all of our staff will participate in this self-study. So it's true professional development for everybody at the, on the high school staff. Here are the seven standards for accreditation that I mentioned earlier. The top four are grounded in teaching and learning standards. The last three are support standards. Now, I could spend a lot of time explaining to you in detail what's under these standards, but what I would uh, suggest you do is at the very end of this presentation, you're going to see that www.neas.org is the website where if you go to this website, it has all the information you could ever want about NEASC, about the committee, about the standards, and the entire process. So feel free if you, if you want to check out that website, and I can always sit down and spend extra time with you one-on-one -on -one if you want to talk about these standards, but it's very comprehensive. Where's my, uh, I get no reply from you tonight. First night I get, every time the airplane goes out, I hear something, but tonight, <laughs> whoops, oh see I talk too much and I got myself in trouble. Okay, so.
So the on-site evaluation visit, and this is the part that's going to happen November 5th through the 8th of 2017. This is a four-day evaluation visit conducted by a committee of educational peers. There are some of the members of this committee that will be dealing with leadership or facility or, or any of those seven standards. As I've served on this, this committee when South Portland High School had theirs several years ago, and I think a lot of you have seen some great improvements that have happened at, at South Portland High School, specifically the facility, for one. The NEASC visit was very instrumental in some of the changes that occurred at South Portland High School. The recommendations made from our, our site visit, um, most of which have been fulfilled to this point. So there's some great information that is gleaned from this site visit. Again, these are professionals, our educational peers from other member schools that, that are a part of this. The third part of the process is a multi-year follow-up. Here's the piece where you take the work that has been completed, the results of the self-study, the results of the site visit, the recommendations of that committee, and you sit down and you create a two- and five-year plan. And then as a school and as a school district, uh, you decide how to address those areas of improvement. And that, again, entails additional professional development. So what does the accreditation status really mean? I mean, what people always ask me, well, why is it important to be accredited from NIAS? What does that really mean? So I, I try to capture this directly from the website. I think this is the best way to reflect. Whether you're a student, a parent, a community member, or the local governing body, colleges, universities, they can all depend on a process that have high standards for accreditation. And it ensures that these public schools throughout New England that are accredited by NEASC have challenging and reasonable expectations. And that at the same time, we're striving to improve what we have in place. Uh, these conditions are not just a visit. We learn what we need to do and then they move on. It's a part of how we do business every single year. <laughs> Thank you. You're fired. She's hired. So the resources to support this process, oh, here's really probably the, the, the nuts and bolts of what I'm sure that most of you were um, interested in hearing tonight. First and foremost, it's, it's hugely important that we have the right leadership in place. And this is, has to be a staff-driven, staff-led self-study. So we selected two very strong school leaders in Lauren Fine and David O'Connor. They are the chairs of our steering committee. They're co-facilitators. They worked with Mike Legage, Greg Oppelstein, Sue Ketch, and myself to create the rest of the leadership. And the rest of the leadership is basically chairs for each of the standards. So we found seven great, well-respected, hard-working, roll-up-my-sleeve, what-do-I-need-to-do leaders in our school. And we pulled those leaders in, and then they were a part of the process of deciding which standard they were going to be the chair of. That's the leadership we have in place at this point. That group that I just described to you is going to be taking the time from last month to the end of the school year, putting everything in place that needs to be in place when we do our self-study next year. And that includes some of them going to these site visits and being on those committees. That includes the resources at the district level and the resources in the community. And anything that we have to have in place, all that prep work is going to be done this year. Now, a lot of schools don't handle it this way. A lot of schools... When they start the process, that's where they begin. But we wanted to front load a lot of the work so that when the staff becomes engaged in this, all the supports and resources that are necessary for them are in place. And it's just a matter of them getting the work, starting, getting started on that work. Part of the planning and preparation um, is what I just described to you. Educating our staff, educating the community. The community has to take a survey. And that survey is going to give us feedback on how the community perceives what we have in place as a school. One of the things that I've learned in talking to the executive director, the current executive director who is new, and the former executive director that um, retired in June, was Scarborough High School is unique in that we own our own language. We own what we have in place for our schools. We call our schools focused, student-centered learning. 
We have a student-centered learning focus. We worked very hard on that K through 12 last year to make sure that that was something that was staff driven. And we have a document that, that captures those thoughts. That's not the language of NEASC. The language of NEASC is core values and mission statement. So when I met with the executive director, I showed him the work that this district and school has in place. He says, you have the components. You just need to crosswalk what you call it at Scarborough with what NEASC calls it. So part of the planning and preparation is we have to do some work to educate our community on what core values and mission statement for NEAS translates into, excuse me, in Scarborough. It's our 24 month learning focus. In our 20, excuse me, in our 24 month plan, it's the student centered learning focus that's the equivalent to that. So there's a lot of work that has to be done to educate all the school stakeholders so that when they see the language from the ask, they have a clear understanding of how that refers to the work that we've already done. The stakeholders involvement is critical and I've already talked to you a little bit about the work that's going to be done uh, at the school level but it's also going to include community, business leaders, um, school board members. Each of you will be asked uh, to look at a role that you might take during the process. And the last two bullets are, are probably um, two of the most important pieces to us moving forward and having a successful accreditation process. Professional development time. This is professional development. We've already discussed a few of the reasons why. Right now at the high school, our content areas are working very well and doing a great job of using the additional Late Start Wednesday we had each month. So one of the Late Start Wednesdays each month is geared toward our PLT district-wide professional development, which is tied to our PEPG, eye observation, all of that is, is, is tied together. The second Late Start Wednesday each month is just for the high school, and it's content area specific. And we're building those standards and doing all the work we have to do for, for the proficiency-based diploma, a lot of work. In addition to that, we have given our departments their department meeting times each month for that work as well. And so we've already have that work in place. Now we have to work on the self-study next year. And there is absolutely no room to do it. No room in the existing schedule. So one of the things that we're going to ask for is we want to ask the board and the school community to support the additional late start time. A lot of the communities that, that I've had discussion with those principals and those schools, there are communities out there that have late start Wednesday every week. And even though that's a transition for some communities that we understand the challenges um, and hopefully we can help support local stakeholders in, in, in some of the challenges they have to face, that is a viable option for us for the self-study process. If we had those other two late start Wednesdays each month, that's three hours a month in-house concentrated work that could be done by all the staff. So it's professional development and it's, it's, it's a comprehensive look at what we do at Scarborough High School and in our district. So that's one of the key resources we're going to need. The other piece is there's budget tied to this. Annually we pay about $3,730 based on our enrollment. So schools of uh, 800 to 1100 pay, that's what our annual um, fee is. In addition to that, we're going to have to prepare for some of the resources necessary for the self-study next year. When the site committee comes, we pay for everything soup to nuts, including travel time and everything that, that's associated with that. The average for the state of Maine in 2012 for a school of 1,000 to 1,100 was a little under $18,000 in 2012. Now, you know the geographic regions in the state of Maine. Staying in one town might cost 18000 Staying in a different community might cost more than 18000 or less. So that was an average. But that has to be a part of our budget process. We do pay for that site committee visit, and we do have to pay for any resources we use during the self-study or any resources we use during that November 5th through the 8th uh, committee site visit. So putting in the budget, what we need to support that is going to be another critical piece we'll need support from you in as well. For the sake of time, I'm not going to ask for questions tonight because I promised that I would keep this brief. But I think if you reflect quickly on what we do at the end of every single faculty meeting, what is, 
What is this going to do transitioning from good to great? Whenever you take a comprehensive look at what you're doing at a school, and it's all the staff that are participating in it with feedback from the community and, and school stakeholders, that that is going to help transition a school from good to great. Making a large school feel small, the more I know about Scarborough, Scarborough Public Schools, the more connected I feel as a school leader. The same thing I think will happen to our staff and our community members. As they learn more about what we do and what we need for supports, excuse me, I think they're going to feel more connected with what happens at the school and more comfortable with what we're doing for their sons and daughters. There's where you can get some more information if necessary. So, any questions? I have from the board. Two quick questions. If, if, the NIAS, if the previous NIAS report is not abundantly, obviously, available to us, can you make that available to us so that we can read it? Yes. And then the other question, which you don't need to have an answer for tonight, but having been on the uh, self-study teams and having written those reports, I know how incredibly onerous they can be and time-consuming. I know that you mentioned additional late starts. Um, the next time that we talk about this, could you maybe have other ideas about ways in which your staff is going to need support yes. to make that? Because I, I, I know how hard it can be. Right. Okay. And uh, to dovetail off of what you're saying, we, when we go to these, if we can get some of our leadership to go to some of the current uh, site visits that are happening. I uh, guess there's seven schools in the state of Maine that are piloting this. So there's going to be feedback given to NEASC about this new process. A big piece that is, is um, really going to help us is the fact that we have one-to-one -one technology now. Most of what's happening with self-study now is digital. We can get into a Google Classroom setup and all the members of a certain committee can be sharing and working on a, on a, on a document mm -hmm. that can all be captured digitally and then once we finalize and had it approved, it can then be transferred over electronically. It was very cumbersome, I think, in the past, some of those things like that that just people weren't comfortable with and they had to collect data and it's that process is significantly <coughs> streamlined. Um, and the other piece to it, I think that it, it's, it's the fact that you don't have to have 12 boxes of what you're going to do for standard number one, two, seven. You can take an exam, and I've looked at what they have now and what they used to have. It's going to be a comprehensive look at what you need to do, but then as a school you can decide, we really need to focus on curriculum or leadership or whatever it is. And you can kind of streamline the process so it moves you toward that piece that you want to do school improvement on. It's not, it doesn't have to be all seven standards have the same. So, yes. I will show you later on. Right. Thank you. Thank Kelly you. and then Christine. So just really briefly, how long is accreditation good for once we get accredited and renewed? How long in, before you d undertake it again? Ten years. Ten years, okay. And could you just speak to some of the consequences if we don't do this well and risk not being accredited? I know it would be impossible to imagine in Scarborough that wouldn't happen, but I imagine there are some districts that struggle and don't take the time to do it the right way. I know when South Portland was going through theirs that they were at risk of losing accreditation because of their facility. And that was one of the big drivers in building their um, new high school addition. So can you just speak a little bit to that about the consequences if we don't take the time to do it well? I mean, I think there are intrinsic and ex extrinsic consequences, to be honest with you. The extrinsic piece is when you're an accredited school, that, I, I had that slide earlier, that, ins that, that makes the community feel very comfortable that what should be in place to support education for students is. From leadership to facilities to instruction curriculum, that's the, that sometimes can be considered the extrinsic piece. We're an accredited school that ensures that certain things are in place. Intrinsically, my fear on things like this is if staff spend an enormous amount of time going into something like this and we, you don't do it well, and we will do this well. We will top shelf to the nth degree. But if you don't manage this well, it can disenfranchise staff. If they're not a part of a good process where they have ownership, they see why it's a valuable process, they benefit from the results and it helps them grow, and then they see the school or school district support whatever changes are necessary to ensure that what we do need to improve then does improve. So reputation is the wrong word. I'm search searching for the right, right word. But if you don't fulfill some of the obligations, then, then 
Uh, there's all kinds of follow-up that's necessary. You can go on a probationary status, um, which will jeopardize uh, your accreditation. And also, it, I think it just sends a poor message to the school community that we underwent a comprehensive process and we didn't make the changes we needed to make or the process wasn't as thorough or done as well as it should. Um, the specifics to what happens when you don't do it, I, I couldn't give you the details so that I could later. I, I was just wondering if there's any funding that's tied to being an accredited. So if, if you don't do it well and you risk losing accreditation, do you not, I don't know if there's any um, funding sources that might not be available to a school that's not accredited? Not that I'm aware of, but I know okay. college and universities look <coughs> to see if a, if a school is accredited, right. and that's a big piece of seeing uh, when a student comes from that. I, I believe the piece that I talked about later, the, the community's confidence in what we're doing yeah. as an educational institution is, uh, you know the implications when they're not confident with what we're doing. Then we do bring, well, whatever we bring forward for support from the community could be jeopardized. But this will be done well, and we'll be very thorough in the process. Sam? All right. I, if I heard you correctly, you said the self-studies in 2016, you said in the fall is the site visit, but you mentioned it was going to be implemented in 1718. So did I, or was I confused by that? Because if the fall visit is the site visit, how could the plan be implemented? So I didn't go into all the details, of it, but basically next year, so we're going to prepare for next year. We'll, we'll conduct our self-study next year. That self-study, all the results of that work will be given to a site committee prior to them coming to the school. They will look at that and they will see what we have come up with in each of those standards and what we have for goals and what we need for improvement. When that committee comes and does their evaluation, they then have to make reports back to NEASC, which is then in turn shared with us. We take the results of that, which would be at the end of the 2017-18 school year, and we start to use that to roll out what are our two and five year plans going to be. Plans are coming Which out. is important because it's okay. probably going to be right around the budget time and when we're deciding what we're going to be doing moving on, you know, in terms of what we're going to focus on as a school or as a school district moving on to the next year or the next few years. And so that's a very timely piece of how we plan for the two and five year plan. Okay, one more thing. You were, when you were speaking about the NEAS language versus the Scarborough language, what came to my mind is a, a Dr. Entwistle sheet, like a one page where on one side it says NEAS term, Scarborough term, to be able to have access to that for the community members, as you mentioned, like so that. We, that's the, the seven, actually the nine, school leaders that I mentioned before, that's going to be part of what we're going to be doing prior to the survey we give to the community as a glossary of terms and give them a, just a little bit of, you know, a sentence or two of what that means in NEASC language and what the language equivalent would be for Scarborough schools. When you say the survey, survey will go out to the community at large or just a directed, is it like an email thing or is this a mailed? It's up for us to decide how to do that piece. Uh, what I envision is perhaps, and I haven't had a chance to um, process this with Dr. Entwistle or some of the other school leaders, but it'll probably be a process where we will decide how that's going to happen and it will be shared with you. And then we will find ways to communicate, communicate that to the community. Our normal communication methods, anything that we need to do. It'll be a spring survey. Um, and it'll be an online type of survey. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Okay, I just a quick one. Um, so you're looking at a, a good deal of work being done in preparation this year, but next year is going to be a time when I'm hearing you ask the board for a possible calendar that asks for every day, of, every week, one morning, late start. It's crucial that we have that. And, and if, if, if we have, if we follow what we know we should be doing here, which is continuing the existing work that's going on, which NEASC says that positively has to happen. Right now we gained late start Wednesdays and we arranged our time in-house at the high school 
to accommodate the professional development we should be doing. We're not going to push that aside. If we don't push that aside and continue to do that, and by the way, a lot of that aligns directly with the standards and the work we're supposed to be doing. So our self-study will capture the fact that this is some things that we should be doing in instruction and curriculum and assessments. But anyhow, that means that if we do follow that, we have to add professional development time. And right now, the professional development time that is a best practice model for a lot of school districts is the late start Wednesdays or professional development time embedded in the school day. And so we would need every day late start Wednesday at the high school. Once a week. Every, every day, week. Every I apologize. Day. One day every week. <laughs> Once a week, yes. Yes. With regards to what you're discussing, the, the late start Wednesday on a weekly basis, would you please provide us uh, as we're working on the calendar actually what the schedule will look like at the high school because you're not going to be changing it every week it's going to be the same every week now if you're going to be shortening so I'd just like to see what that would look like sure so depending on which of the two models that we go with in either model the advisory and academic support time will not be a part of a late start Wednesday it'll all be geared with classes Four classes would still meet on that day. They will just be abbreviated. I, I personally like to see it in writing and whenever it's available. Sure. Thank you. So when we, that, that will probably be January, end of January when we finalize. Whenever it's available. Show sure what that looks like. By the way, during late starts right now, if you ever have a chance to come in on a high school late start and walk in, you'll see 100, 150, students in the cafeteria having a breakfast on their laptops doing work and it's really working really well for those students that have to take the bus and come in. It's really kind of played out how we hoped it would that those who can't get a ride to come in later, they get that. Those that have to come in the bus or get dropped off by their parents early, they're able to come in. They have a comfortable, spacious area to go and do some work. They have their laptops now <coughs> and they're really able to do some work uh, prior to school starting. So. That's worked pretty well for us at the high school this year thus far. Thank you. In Any anticipation other? of that question, perhaps. Anything else? No? Very good. Thank you very much. Mr. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Davis. Okay, moving on to uh, 7.2 curriculum update. Mm -hmm. um, Mo Monique has provided a, um, an update on the work uh, being done to advance. Uh, our curriculum in all of the content areas um, each year and it's usually happened in October and we have had a few things kind of pushed back a little bit this year so it's happening now in December but um, I, I, you'll uh, get a good sense about how things are evolving uh, in terms of um, the work being done at all places this year. Is this a Prezi or is this a uh, Principal Creech type? Transitions are going to be so quick you will not notice. <laughs> <laughs> the Prezi's and the competition between these transitions are decided to not include a single transition. It's <laughs> very basic. I hope I keep you all awake. <laughs> Uh, thank you. This is an annual presentation. We've been a little bit delayed because of all that's on our plate, as Dr. Entwistle has uh, stated. Uh, so uh, we've got a little bit more to uh, report, actually a little further along in this year. Um, but I would like to remind you, uh, last year I talked a little bit about how um, gone are the days where you bring a committee together to identify a textbook, you order the textbook, you put a stamp on it, and you hand it out. Gone are those days, um, thankfully so in some respects, uh, because we know a little bit more about the teaching and learning process, and we actually have more um, technology and more experiences that are more effective for our students. Uh, so what used to be a very predictable replacement improvement process, now as we're creating curriculum opportunities for students for this century, the 21st century, 
it's really about being responsive and flexible in that process. So we are currently always assessing, planning, implementing, and reflecting, and looking for improvements on an ongoing basis. So we really are only limited um, by our resources. Uh, this multimedia online environment provides wonderful opportunities. Um, it gives students the opportunity to, to take part in real life um, experiences, but getting that software up, supported, having the infrastructure to support that, having the staff to make sure that when the student logs in and is enrolled and the teacher accesses the information, they have all the information at hand, that requires some resources. That requires some application specialists. And in previous budget years, um, the board has supported that. Uh, but we're always looking for more in that area. So what I'd like to do tonight is talk a little bit about um, each of the content areas and then summarize that at the end. Um, literacy, uh, as you know, K-5, we've been working on implementing the Readers and Writers Workshop model. Originally, we had planned for a two-year implementation. We are pushing that out a bit. We're adding an additional year. Uh, because, and this is going to sound a bit like a broken record, because of our limitations in terms of time, a limited resource, we've not been able to make the progress that we wanted to have um, happen at this point in time. Uh, and 6-8, we're working um, on our curriculum, uh, and we're really just revising at this point. The middle school is looking at and working with 3-5, as well as with the high school. 912, as uh, Principal Preach described, those departments are working very hard. They're maximizing the time available, and they are working right now on writing and focusing on common writing rubrics across the boards, but also across departments as well. So if social studies teachers are working on pieces of writing, they're using the same feedback um, to their students as the ELA. So they're working on that as well. Um, high school has had the benefit of this additional time. K-8 has not had the benefit of the additional time. So some pieces at the K-8 have slowed down as a result. <clears throat> in the area of mathematics, K-5, we're in our fifth year, and it was time to do a bit of a refresher. So we had our teachers, all our teachers at K-5 participate in a refresher. We brought professional development in to help support teachers and it was a good time to bring their skill level up to another level. So for example, one of the focuses of our curriculum is teaching students how to deal with novel problems and having them develop perseverance in the area of problem solving. We call that productive struggle. And so much of the professional development was in that area, as well as our ongoing efforts in providing family math nights, volunteer trainings, uh, and looking at our assessment practices. Middle and high school have developed a wonderful relationship. They worked together this summer to develop common standards um, and assessments. They're working on their assessments and looking at scoring guides as well. Uh, while we're maximizing this time, um, we've been able to add, um, we've leveraged grant funds to add two positions um, or partial positions and they're referred to as 612 Curriculum Instructional Coaches for Sciences and a 612 Curriculum Instructional Coach for the Humanities. The idea here is to provide better communication between 612 to get the teachers together, to have conversations to make sure that the learning that takes place in middle school moves on to learning at the high school so that there is a seamless transition there. We're a little behind getting that going as a result of the um, late budget approval and hiring those folks and getting those folks going. So we are um, introducing and rolling those folks out. They're developing their plans. Uh, and so they're going to pick up with some of this work uh, as we move forward. Word languages and the arts. As you know, um, in the past, we have been rebuilding word languages at the middle school. And we put a pause this past year because of budget priorities in other areas. But I do want to assure folks that those investments have created improved learning, both in terms of an expansion of time as a result of the new schedule at the middle school, but also in terms of that team gelling, working on their curriculum, 
Uh, there have been some um, improvements in what the high school teachers are seeing and the student skills coming up to the high school, and that's what we want to see. We've had exploration at the elementary. The UNIBE experience has benefited both staff and students at the K-2. The high school level, we've had conversations. We've been supporting a teacher in the World Languages Department in his learning Chinese through the Confucius Institute at USM. We're beginning, we've just had um, this week, uh, conversations around the possibilities of being able to offer Chinese at the high school this next year. But we're also planning in um, across multiple years to say, okay, if students are um, successful with one year of Chinese, what are we going to offer them after that? So we're having those conversations and looking at those possibilities, and again, as resources allow. In the area of visual and performing arts, we've been rebuilding at the middle school and, and the high school, and that has continued. Um, that additional sta staffing that was added last year and in previous years has created more opportunities for students. Um, not only additional staffing, but again, at the middle school, additional time, and with the schedule changes that Principal Creech talked about in previous board meeting, we're looking forward to having um, more time and more students accessing those electives in those areas. There's still more, more work to be done in the visual performing arts as well as in world languages. We're also looking at um, the impact that the reductions have had. I had conversations with the music teachers in band in particular because of the reductions at the elementary level and the middle school. Our students haven't been able to progress as they have in the past kind of like the world language issue. Uh, so we'll be looking as a leadership council to talk about our priorities in rebuilding in these areas for this coming budget season. Science and technology, very exciting area here. We've had some um, in, an infusion of resources here. Uh, as you know, the next gen science standards are the new science standards. Uh, and we had, um, had an interesting thing happen. We had middle school teachers come to me last year as I, we were looking at these standards and reviewing these standards, uh, and they were rather adamant that we need to do something now. I said, well, let's see, what do we, you know, let's take a look at materials, let's take a look at what the NGSS standards. Uh, and they did that, they did the research. I said, we're, we have a pretty tight timeline here. We're gonna have to be very careful with resources and professional development. But we went through an extensive review process and an evaluation of curriculum materials. And we were able to move forward just this fall very quickly, literally materials landing on a uh, Wednesday, staff volunteering their time to sort through all the materials and then the professional development uh, scheduled for the very next week. But I can say that the teachers are very, very exciting. It's truly an inquiry-based science curriculum where students are generating their questions, they're planning their experiments, and they are learning science like uh, they have never been before. While we had a kit system in place and we had strong curriculum programs, as I shared before, those curriculum materials were over 20 years old. So it was time that they were replaced. But given what we know about learning in the area of science, uh, <clears throat> we were able to access this high quality um, curriculum. We're the first district in Maine um, to have this curriculum here. So they were very gracious with their resources. Uh, so that enabled us to really get going in a strong way. Uh, at 3.5 in the area of engineering, as you know, um, we um, were supported by um, a 1.0 FTE, a STEM teacher at Wentworth. Uh, and again, because of the delayed budget approval, she was already engaged in a contract in another school district, so we had to wait a month. And then as she came on board, we had about a week to prepare a curriculum. Luckily, she'd had experience in um, a variety of different curriculum uh, materials. And so we began to build that curriculum. Uh, we have a plan for a three-year curriculum, and our hope is to leverage our through our school um, and business partnership, level some industry partners who will come in, some engineers from a variety of different fields, and work with the teacher on some of the design elements and experiments that they're doing now. Uh, that special at Wentworth has now taken over, sorry PE and health, but it's now the favorite special in the school. Students are very, very excited about that special. Middle school, we've had a program in place um, for quite a bit of time. We've actually, in building this curriculum, got those folks together to talk about what they do to make sure we weren't repeating things. Um, there's going to be a very exciting um, uh, rockets 
uh, a a activity with the fifth graders. I probably shouldn't say too much because it's very exciting. But we've also connected with the high school and um, Mr. Bither at the high school with his seniors does a wonderful rocket launching. And so given the outdoor classroom at Wentworth, we'll, our fifth grade students well may be able to engage with high school students and see what they're doing in high school in and around that area of rocketry. So we're very excited about that. Uh, at 9-12, um, we have benefited um, from the introduction of some new courses at the high school. Uh, and these courses were um, added in response to the interest and the need on the part of um, uh, our program of studies to be updated to reflect some of the interests of the students. Uh, but please understand that these courses, while there were no new staff added, meant that other courses didn't fly as a result. And so one of the issues with our current schedule and one of the reasons for moving towards a new schedule is to be able to provide more opportunities for students. This will result in the need and the request for additional staff at the high school in order to make that happen. One of the areas is in, in science. Um, and as uh, the high school leadership team works to set their priorities for next year, you'll hear a little bit more about the need in those areas. Uh, technology, also an area of pretty exciting, and this is a result of the support around the tech integrators. Uh, as you know, most recently, um, the hour of code activities have um, been underway in the schools with uh, the middle school is scheduled for Monday. The middle school, I believe, we met in a planning meeting today, have about 15 uh, visitors coming in at the middle school who are going to be doing presentations for students. We also have had the tech integrators have been working with the classroom teachers at helping them learn some of the coding activities so some of those activities can be infused in the curriculum. So for example, at K2 and 3-5, some of that computate, what we refer to as computational thinking activities are now part of our core curriculum. It's not just a special event, it's certainly a catalyst to generate interest, but that is embedded within the curriculum now and in that integration. So we're very excited about that, as well as the work that the tech integrators are doing with teachers and students around digital literacy um, and uh, digital citizenship, staying safe online. So we greatly appreciate our um, school business partnership in that area. It's been very, very helpful to us. Social studies, health and PE and career education, these are areas which we have made um, some advances, but not uh, a lot. I'd like to see more in this area. Uh, middle school and high school worked this summer together working on their curriculum. Uh, we also have two folks, two of our leaders, who have been um, selected to represent um, Scarborough on a state social studies task force. So that's very exciting for us, and we'll be able to keep an ear on what uh, is going to be going on at the state level in and around social studies. Uh, we look constantly for opportunities to integrate in these areas, especially at the K-5. K-5 teachers teach all content areas. So while we're focusing on literacy and we're maximizing before school time, after school time, professional development time, as we infuse other pieces, for example, the coding and the computational thinking, that's curriculum workshop time that's not going to literacy. So we have to make some tough calls in terms of here's, the, here's what we have for time, how are we going to use that? And that's one of the reasons why the literacy implementation has slowed a bit we have not gone full bore even with the coding. We've done a bit of it at a, at a time because we're um, limited by that time. Um, we could keep the K-5 teachers learning and growing, K-8 teachers actually because of the needs in these particular areas as well as in sciences, um, busy every week with um, a uh, delayed start schedule. Uh, that would help us really move forward. A uh, wonderful um, example of that, I was working with the uh, uh, K-2 uh, literacy instructional coach today and she said, you know, um, we do the best we can with time, but here's the thing that just doesn't make sense to me. And I said, what is it? And she said, we have a curriculum in place, this workshop model where we ask students to reflect on their writing and make improvements in the process of writing and their practice of writing but we don't do that for teachers. 
we don't allow them the opportunity to reflect on their lessons, adjust their lessons, and to continue planning in a, in an, in a time frame that's more frequent than once a month. So while we provide the professional development, we teach them the mechanics of the instructional practice, we don't allow them to develop their practice by reflection. And so that's one of the pieces that we'd like to see built in if we could access um, and have the support for that late start at once a week. I would be remiss without mentioning the guiding principles. The guiding principles are certainly a work in progress. Those are the our overarching goals that we have for our students. Uh, they are part of the proficiency-based diploma requirement, and the Leadership Council will be taking on how we're going to proceed with this uh, piece. Last year, I provided a bit of a summary with a scale, sort of a full picture summary of where we are with a little bit of a rubric. Um, the rubric in terms of the scale, um, zero would be does not exist, one would be less than adequate, two is adequate but not necessarily competitive with area schools, three would be sufficient and competitive. And so what I've done for this year is captured where we were last year, but also indicated where we've made improvements. And for example, literacy, we're still there because we're not progressing as much as we wanted to. We have not started implementing reading. Reading will be huge. Reading is not just the instructional pieces. It's also a review and a refresh of all classroom libraries. So it's quite large. Uh, in mathematics, we're holding our own there. Uh, science and technology, as I've described, at 3.5. We certainly, by adding that position, the STEM teacher there, we've made some gains there. We still, in terms of the classroom teachers, have not had the resource of time to be able to look at the science standards and make some changes there. 6.8, we've moved forward at 6.8. And certainly at 9.12, in terms of the additional coursework. 6-8, uh, certainly a, as a result of the science curriculum itself. Uh, visual and performing arts, as a result of the additional staffing in those areas, we've been able to add programming and add time for our students, and thus the reason for the gain in those areas. Questions? Yes. Uh, all right. Can I share Oh, thank you. Uh, the first one is, and you may not be able to answer this right at the moment, but how do we reconcile not having enough time uh, in one of your presentations? We don't have enough time to do thus and so with the fact that, that we're asking or we're going to be a asked to provide more uh, teacher time. So it's, ta again, taking away from the classroom time for children, that's a tough one. Absolutely. That is a very difficult one. But it's one that we as board members are going to have to address. Uh, and my question is, does, does this entail lengthening the school day? Well, I, you don't, you can't, I don't think you can answer that, but... I think my comment would be there'll never be enough time. There's never enough time anywhere. You know, there's 24 hours a day. We have to make decisions about how we best use that time. Uh, when we talk about the need for time, though, one of the pieces for me is that if we have to reduce the time, the instructional time for students to add the time for teachers, I want to be sure that when the teacher goes back in the classroom, they're a better teacher. And the quality of the instruction has improved. And that's why we have been very careful. Um, you heard Principal Greech talk about even the self-study portion of the NEASC is about getting better at what we do. It's professional development time. So it's all about improving what we do with students. So um, that instructional time, although reduced, the benefit is the quality of the instruction as a result of that time. So can the quality, may I follow up? The quality of instruction can offset the lack uh, or the loss of time? That is the goal. Okay. My second question is, how many more staff 
should we have K-12, in your opinion, to be fully staffed in Scarborough? I would need some time to put those numbers together, and I'd need a little bit more detail about what you mean by fully staffed. Well, no. You said we need <coughs> staff. Everybody says we need staff. You folks are the professionals. You're, you're the curriculum leaders. So what I would like to know before we go into the budget is how many more staff we should have to be completely staffed in Scarborough. Okay. Happy to define that for you. And we can certainly work together to provide a proposal. Like I said, I don't expect an answer to these mm -hmm. tonight. But I think they're questions that the board needs to deal with. Anyone else? I have a few fun clarifying statements and some questions. You made a comment that literacy development at K2 has slowed due to time, correct? We had planned on a two-year implementation of the curriculum to be fully implemented in two years. Okay. That's what's slowed. Okay. That's we are stretching that out to three years and I believe our Probably the work we do with curriculum libraries will probably go beyond that as well. Okay. Then also under math, mm -hmm. you had mentioned there were two new positions, 6 through 12. One for humanities and what was the other? Sciences. Sciences. Can we Those were grant funded. Yes. We yeah. leveraged our Title IIA funds in order to support part-time positions for each of those areas. That's what I was going to say. Those are not full-time positions. <coughs> They're part-time positions. So when do, when, does, when do the grant funds <laughs> run out? <laughs> They're annual funds as part of our No Child um, Left Behind federal funds that come every year. But we do are putting these positions forward as we must as one-year positions. Any other questions? Yes, Lizzie. Um, so, when you were talking about the foreign language portion of the curriculum, um, I was wondering more clarification for me, because I've only been at Scarborough for a couple of years. Um, what school are students like first exposed to foreign language classes? In the middle school. Okay, so in the school. Sixth grade. And are there any plans to start that earlier, or are we content with the middle school? For like six years. Uh, when we um, developed our rebuilding plan for world languages, the idea was to build sufficient and build backwards. Um, and so I believe the middle school, the last time I checked in, there was an interest for additional staff at the middle school to be able to provide students with choice of language and to be able to provide more uh, time for students and then work backwards into 3-5 and then K-2. Just to piggyback on what Lizzie just said, just so you know, since you said you've only been here a couple of years, foreign language <coughs> used to start even at Wentworth. So in, in the third, fourth, and fifth grade, they had it. It wasn't as intensive, but literally if you started in sixth grade in the language and you took sixth, seventh, and eighth of the same language, you could show up for your freshman year of high school and start in level two of that language. You can no longer do that. It'll be another, I believe it'll be another year or so before we have, some are, before we have the numbers where, that we had in the past, it'll be, it'll be a little while yet, but some are. Kelly again? So just to clarify, I, I'm intrigued by your question on the three through five, is that a possibility of foreign language? As we begin to, uh, begin our budget discussions as a leadership council and as phase levels, we certainly are going to add that into the mix. Um, but at a certain point, we have to develop some reasonable priorities given the priorities at every phase level. Um, so yes, it is a, it, it's a possibility. A couple more things. I promise not much. Um, the hour of code, you mentioned visitors to the middle school. Mm -hmm. Are those volunteers? Yes, they're volunteers, they are parents, they are community members, they are folks we've made connections um, with through the school and business partnership. Uh, they'll be doing presentations for students, they may even be modeling activities, they're software engineers, they're people who have an interest in coding. 
Um, it runs the gamut. We also have a professor from USM who is um, a, uh, a, a guru in the creative process and so he's going to be working with the kids at tying the creative process with the critical thinking process um, and connecting with the arts and the coding. So lots of wonderful opportunities. I'm on because I think it's important for people to know that's happening. K2, we had a similar piece. We had several, not as many as 15 presentations, but at K2, we had presentations. We had community members come in and work with uh, the little ones. 3-5, uh, we have kind of a cycle now that we've been doing the Hour of Code a bit. And this year, it was more focused in classroom and classroom activities because last year at 3-5, we had lots of people come in and do presentations. So at the high school, we've had actually um, in the learning commons area, our tech integrator has been working on some little stations, some makey makey stations to engage students. We had a Sphero um, uh, robot, a little droid, um, where students would come and program the droid in the uh, learning commons that day. We stopped in and while students were a little hesitant, uh, the tech integrator got them engaged and playing with that. We had a makey makey kit set up so students could um, play the piano, um, the banana piano via the computer or the bongos via the uh, banana. So they did lots of little kinds of things and she has some plans to continue that throughout the year. I know it's a huge step. Personally, K through two. Mm -hmm. My son came home every day that they did something. It was like, today Dick and Dot came to our room. And two little robots and <laughs> told us all about it. So it's a huge success and he said that somebody came in and and spoke to their class and talked to them about right it. Right before Christmas maybe wasn't the best time to read <laughs> 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 I've actually heard that from other people yeah. too. But yeah. <laughs> so we're following up. Uh, the resource librarians are coming up with titles, of coding books for students, and we're following it up and integrating that in the curriculum. The, the instructional coach actually, um, to help the teachers tie it in, uh, within writing, actually, um, she shared this piece with me. In first grade, it, they're focusing on writing all about something. So their all about writing was about one activity that they tried during Hour of Code. So in second grade, it's a, their focus is on opinion writing and in your opinion. So the question, their writing prompt was, in your opinion, what was the most exciting coding activity you tried this week? You know, and then there's always a, be sure to tell why you think that. So they're tying that in and integrating those activities just in a wonderfully seamless uh, manner. Anything else? I just have one more. Um, when you were showing us the little graphs with the, like, on the scale of what, the zero to three, mm -hmm. when you were talking about literacy, you used the term that there was going to be a refreshment of all classroom libraries. And when that comes to mind, I automatically think of new textbooks and stuff like that, but I'm not quite sure that's 100% what you meant. So could you kind of clarify what you meant by that? Sure. In every elementary and actually in middle school and some high schools, there are what are called classroom libraries. Those are the titles that students can choose to read for a variety of purposes. Some books are just write books where students are um, independently reading those books for interest. Some books are for instructional purposes. Uh, and so they are at their level of reading, at their reading level, and they use those books to practice and improve their proficiency in reading. And so we try to have a whole range of what we refer to as leveled books for the various readers in every classroom, interest books, books students are interested in. So every elementary classroom needs a whole lot of books. Uh, we, because of budget reductions, teachers have had um, very little money to sort of refresh those libraries. Um, but it's also about how they organize the libraries and make the books available to students. And so, it, I mean, it, it sounds rather odd, but the way in which you display your books, the way in which you organize the books, the way in which you teach students how to access books, um, all matters in creating reading um, and readers. Uh, and so that takes some professional development, but it also takes quite a bit of research in terms of um, finding those books organizing those books, ordering those books, getting those books in, inventorying those books um, for the classrooms um, and the libraries. Um, and as students change and their interests change, it takes a couple of years to really build a solid library. So that's what we were talk I was referring to. <coughs> okay, and, and just finally, um, 
in looking at this, I'm, I'm somewhat encouraged in that there has been slight improvement over the last year. I'm a little concerned about the literacy not growing um, as quickly at the K2 or K5 level as it maybe should, or as you anticipated it, it would, and I'm assuming that that means more time is needed to work on that. Absolutely. It's time for the teachers to reflect on their lessons and to work together and to improve those lessons. Um, but also the implications for 9-12 is very significant. You see, we have a bump at 6 to 8 there where things get stronger again and yet a drop off at 9-12. And 9-12 is a combination of time and as well as staffing. Um, because of the courses that are unavailable to students as a result of limitations of staffing. Now the schedule will free that up, um, but there will be a need for uh, staffing as well. Uh, the, uh, yeah, uh, Principal Creech described the reasons um, that NEAS, the accreditation process, that self-study process will also be very, very helpful to the staff in seeing further improvements as well. So the time for that is very important. Okay, we all set? Yes. If I could ask a quick follow up. I've heard anecdotally um, it suggested that, that one, perhaps one of the reasons why there hasn't been development in some of these areas is because of the amount of time standardized testing is taking. And I wonder to what degree do you account for that? And is that part of your conversation? Uh, it's certainly, standardized testing itself um, has taken um, instructional time. It's also taken time in terms of after school time, in terms of teachers preparing for those pieces. Um, but it, it falls within a particular window of time. So it really doesn't take more of the teacher's time than one or two meetings in terms of meeting time. In terms of instructional time, the, at three through eight in particular, the state testing, the amount of state testing time hasn't varied much. It's always been consistent. Certainly, if that testing time could be reduced, there could be more time for instruction. Absolutely. But it's not as if this past year was significantly, right. high school was, it was a very different test than the SAT. Now they're going back to the SAT. I just wondered if that was something that you assessed. Not in a formal way, certainly anecdotally, um, absolutely. That March window of, un you know, that no big holidays, wonderful times, um, that does get taken up with the testing. Uh, that said, students, even though students are only tested for a total number of hours, say six hours, because of the disruptions in the instructional schedule, that doesn't, isn't really optimal for a learning system. Thanks. Very good, thank you very much. Thank you. Very nice, thank you. Moving on to 9.0. I would need an executive. There's a number in here, if anybody noticed. Mm -hmm. To be correct, I, it should be 8.0. Right. Oh. <laughs> thank you. There we go. <laughs> okay, that should be 8.0. And I would need a motion to go into executive session pursuant to 1 MRSA subsection 4056C for the purpose of determining the direction and the process of superintendent and search not to return to public session. So moved. Second. Very good. All in favor? Seven. Very good.